Hi friends! My name is Emily and welcome to part one of my March reading wrap-up. Due to global pandemic, there are more books here than normal. I think the last time I read this many books I had like a week and a half booked off to recover from having my wisdom teeth taken out. So this is not normal. I just want to say that because I know oftentimes folks look at these reading wrap-ups and they're like, oh my god, I read like one book in a year. I feel like a failure and that's not the point. This is how I deal with stress. I deal with stress by reading and uh, you see that reflected <laughs> in what I have done in the past month. So I read 17 books. I'm going to talk about 10 of them in this video and seven of them in part two. This year I am trying to keep track of my stats. I am trying to read what I own. The first book that I read in March was Night Shift by Stephen King. This is a short story collection by Stephen King that I read with my patrons. So I host a book club called the Red Rum Book Club. It's a patron exclusive. We have been reading the first six books in Stephen King's bibliography. I finished this up right at the beginning of the month for our live show. This, like any short story collection, was a bit of a mixed bag. There were things that I really enjoyed, like I I get a big kick out of trucks because I have always thought that trucks and cars have faces and to see the trucks come alive and like start attacking people at this gas station was like so much fun. What we ended up talking about in the live show was a couple of the stories that play with horror figures and adapt them in some way. So I ended up learning about, oh, what is his name? Springheeled Jack, which has some historical bases, which I thought was really cool. I enjoyed the conversation about this book and the stories in this book more than I enjoyed the process of reading it. There are other Stephen King short story collections that I would recommend more than this one. Like I think different seasons, I enjoyed all four short stories or novellas a lot more than I enjoyed anything in here. And if you were looking to pick up King short stories, I don't know that I would recommend this one personally, but then again, it's always hard to recommend short story collections. This came off my TBR and I ended up giving it three stars. The next book that I read, I actually have a reading vlog dedicated to. Now I do spoil the book, but in March I was reading women's horror. Other than Stephen King, I read exclusively women in March right up until shit got real with COVID. White is Her Witching by Helen Oyeyemi was one of those books and this is so good. It is so good. So like a lot of women's horror that's come before it, like Shirley Jackson, I'm thinking specifically with The Haunting of Hill House, this is about the Silver family and specifically the Silver family home that the family is currently occupying. The home is actually one of the narrative point of views. And so we get to see the house's really icky possessiveness over the women that occupy its walls. The house is also deeply racist. It is deeply horrifying. And Miranda has pica, so she has this compulsion to eat things that are not food. So if we're thinking about women's horror, I think it's fascinating that the home, the domestic space, and then food, nourishment, the body play a huge role in this story. And if you are okay with slightly disordered eating, I would highly recommend White is for Witching. It is beautifully written, just weird and surreal, and I have a whole vlog dedicated to it where I check in with the experience as I go. I do spoil it, so if you plan on reading it, watch it after. This came from my TBR and I ended up giving it five out of five stars. The next book I read for a book club, my in real life book club that ended up meeting via Zoom because of COVID, um, decided to read The Marrow Thieves by Sherry de Moline. So this is a piece of indigenous dystopian literature set in a near future Canada where we've destroyed the planet. Alongside that, the sort of magical fantasy aspect of this is that everybody has lost the ability to dream except for indigenous folks. Dreams are 
caught in the marrow of their bones, and so white people have started capturing and harvesting the bones of indigenous folks. It mirrors the residential school system very much in terms of how indigenous folks are being hunted and captured and institutionalized. So Frenchie is on the run and he meets a group of indigenous folks also on the run, and there are elders and they are passing knowledge down to these young folks who don't necessarily have the means to survive growing up in like the suburbs of Toronto. Like you may not have the hunting and camping skills to survive in the wilderness as they move their way north. So there's a lot of passing of knowledge, traditional culture, storytelling, and language is super important. There's a coming to story for each of the characters where we learn about how each of them came to be alone and how they each came to join this ragtag family. There's only so much you can do with an on-the-run narrative and parts of it feel haphazard and a little bit confusing and we talked about this in the book club. We almost wanted more, like this is quite a small book, but we almost feel like we wanted more from it, especially when because this is an on-the-run narrative and they're working towards finding this rumored safety in the north, by the time they find what they are looking for, there is not a lot of time there. Overall, so much going on here. Would definitely recommend that you check this out still. I just think it's important to set the expectation that <sighs> this is very much about the characters and their journey opposed to the destination. And I feel like there may have been a little bit more satisfaction in more time spent in the destination. And I ended up giving this five out of five stars. Despite some of the critiques, I still think this is something that I will reread. It sparked an interest in Sherry de Malin, as you will see in an upcoming book. This did come from my TBR. The next book that I finished, I finished on audio, and it was Come As You Are by Emily Ngozi. This I picked up up because Hannah Witten recommended it at some point. It is all about women and sexual desire and accelerators and breaks and like it was on my TBR. I used a credit on Audible and I have been carrying it on my TBR for probably four or five months now, if not half a year. I think I left it up to like the last 30 minutes of the audiobook and then I just could not be bothered to finish it. Because I read so much of it, I do feel like it's fair to give it a three out of five stars. I find a lot of these self-help books and their metaphors patronizing and obnoxious. So three out of five stars because I didn't enjoy it. I couldn't be bothered to finish it. I think my interest always lies more with either personal essay accounts, so women talking about their own experiences, or research, like actual studies that have been done. A lot of these self-help books feel patronizing. Oh, I lied! I lied! I gave it two to five stars. I'm just looking at my my notes here and I gave it two to five stars. So the next book that I read, I read on my Amazon Fire thingy that my sister bought me for D&D. It was Lock and Key Volume 1 by Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez. In a previous video, my annotation video, I talked about how I don't enjoy e-reading because I like to take notes. I don't enjoy the highlighting and like finger typing process. No judgment if that is like your favorite way of reading, different strokes for different folks, all that jazz, but it's never been something that I enjoy until I experienced graphic novels on an e-reader. This may be the superior way for me to engage in a graphic novel because something that I always struggle with is when I turn the page, like the most flashy, exciting illustration will often catch my eye and I find it hard to focus and like go through each panel when like something on the far right corner is what's drawing my eye. I'm not sure this is true for all e-readers, but with the Kindle you can touch a panel and enlarge it and scroll from panel to panel and not be spoiled for like the rest of the thing. I feel like I prefer graphic novels in digital format because of how like easily distracted I am while reading a graphic novel. So I just wanted to amend my, my previous thoughts on e-reading. I think specifically for me this works super well. 
to go on to Lock and Key. I really enjoyed the Lock and Key adaptation on Netflix, although the feedback that I heard from a lot of my coworkers who had read the graphic novels was that they didn't love the show because it felt very teen. Like you could see Riverdale's sticky little fingers all over the Lock and Key adaptation. I mean, I definitely see that. Having read the first graphic novel, uh, they definitely clean up what I feel like is very comfortably an adult graphic novel and make the television show teen friendly. Because I came to the television show first, I am enjoying the graphic novels. I gave it a four out of five stars, which is enough for me to be interested in seeing this complete unit. I think that's the other appeal is that there are six volumes and it is a complete unit. If you don't know, Lock and Key is the story of this family whose father has been murdered by one of their schoolmates and so they move from their home into their father's childhood home, the Key House, and there's a lot of mystery uh, surrounding their father's childhood and the kids are discovering that the house has some secrets. It has some fun, maybe not so fun, potentially dangerous, magical keys hidden in it. The next book that I read was In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. So this is something that I covered in a women in horror vlog. This is playing with the form of memoir. So Machado is talking about domestic violence within a same-sex relationship. The hardships that she faced because I guess the idea is that two women in a relationship, you are escaping patriarchy, you are ex escaping toxic masculinity and any of the like domestic violence that can happen in a heterosexual relationship. And so the idea is that two women is this like lesbian utopia, you'll never have any problems. But the problem is that nobody is raised in a vacuum. And so oftentimes women have grown up in abusive households. It doesn't matter your gender. If you had abuse in your past, that is something that you need to deal with. Machado is in a relationship with a woman who, or was in a relationship with a woman, where that woman comes from an abusive household and she is reproducing a lot of that and it's Machado's journey of living through that relationship and it plays with form. So I talk about this in the vlog but there are these little vignettes. There is a choose your own adventure story that is cyclical. It's like it ends up putting you as the reader in the experience of like why people stay with their abusers because the the nature of the choose your own adventure is cyclical and if you are okay reading narratives of abuse like if that content won't bother you uh, and you like memoirs I would highly recommend this because it's just so fascinating to see people playing with form. So this came off my TBR and I did give it five out of five stars. So the next book I have here is for Lumos. Lumos is a reading project where I am rereading the Harry Potter series and teaching period. I'm teaching. I'm teaching the series uh, based on things that interest me and so it was time to read Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. There is a reading vlog for this that I will link. This was all right. I think I thought I would like this more than I ended up liking it. Like as somebody who's looking to teach the series, there is not a lot to work with here and currently I'm working on scripting an episode on werewolf werewolfism and HIV AIDS and because there is so little to actually work with in here, I'm going to have to dip into Order of the Phoenix and Half-Blood Prince. Like, I thought there was more going on here than there is. I mean, I, I don't think I need to describe this as Harry Potter, but I think out of the three that I've read so far, my favorite at this point is Chamber of Secrets, then Philosopher's Stone, then Prisoner of Azkaban. So this, at this moment, on this reread, this is my least favorite. I mean, I still enjoyed it because it's fun children's literature, but I mean, in the grand scheme of the Harry Potter series, it's all right. The next thing that I read was book one of The Stand. So The Stand is divided into three books. And like I mentioned earlier, this is part of the Red Rum Book Club, a patron exclusive book club. We decided to break the stand up into three parts. So in March, we covered book 
one, which is where the biological warfare, escaping the facility and destroying the population, it sets the stage for book two and three. And unfortunately, or fortunately, very coincidentally, because I planned this project over a year ago, and it just so happens that we were reading the stand and I was personally picking up the stand as COVID-19 got really real. Kind of a weird coincidence um, and definitely added to the experience of reading this first book where we meet quite a few of the characters that will be important for the rest of the novel. It's where we watch the plague, the super flu spread. And in some ways it was comforting because like this is so extreme that to see what is happening in real life, which can feel very scary, um, but isn't as scary as it could be. I enjoyed the first part and The Stand is a book that I read a while ago that I didn't enjoy the first time I read it. I have a review for it that uh, I ended up privating because men of the internet got very upset with me that I didn't like The Stand. There was a lot of just like sexism hurled at me because I didn't like The Stand and I am entitled to my opinion. I maintain that. Uh, I took the video down for my mental health and well-being because just the the violence and the aggression that came at me because I didn't enjoy The Stand the first time I read it, I had to take it down. Like, I don't want to go into this disliking it. I am hopeful that I end up enjoying this experience. I mean, my critiques from the first time I read it remain true. I think it is bloated in some places and I think that there are too many perspectives and I don't like enough of the perspectives. And that is an issue that I think with any multiple POV novel, you will run into, right? Like if you don't like enough of the perspectives in the A Song of Ice and Fire series, you are not going to enjoy the series. And yet when I said the same thing about The Stand, I got personally attacked. <laughs> so I mean, my critiques of the first read through remain true. I like two of the characters. I like Nick, our deaf, mute, blind in one eye sweetheart. And I like Stu. I like the like kind everyman, everybody else I'm either indifferent towards or actively repulsed by. I'm looking at you, Harold Laudner, you disgusting piece of shit who thinks he can own Franny simply because he is the only man left within like miles of Franny. Gross. Harold can go die. He should have fallen off that roof. It's really the Red Rum Book Club that is saving this so far. It's that I've got to talk about this with other people. Whereas last time I read it by myself and I was like, Ugh. But like the live show was fantastic because for the first little bit it seemed like the chat was all ladies and they were all like, oh my gosh, yes, Harold is disgusting. And like to have other people uh, validate and just like vent about certain things and to see that we were on the same page about certain things was so good. That was a very long-winded way of saying that not much has changed in terms of my critiques but I'm enjoying it a little bit more. So that naturally is a reread. The next book that I read is Empire of the Wild by Sherry de Moline. This has been blowing up in Canadian bookstores. It's an Indigo staff pick of the month. I lied. It's Indigo's number one book of the year. Even better than a staff pick of the month. So I gave it four to five stars, but I think I might bump it up to five stars because the more that I think about it, the more I love it. This is about a, uh, a Métis woman who is like brokenhearted and she searches for her husband Victor. So she has a history of dating kind of shitty dudes. Then she meets Victor and she brings him home and everyone's like, ugh, here we go again. But she and Victor are perfection. They are 
meant for each other, like their relationship is goals. Victor disappears and she's fully convinced that Victor has been kidnapped, that Victor needs saving, that she needs to search for him. And everybody else is like, no, you married another dirtbag. He ran out on you. And she's like, no, no, I, I fully believe that he needs to be found. And so she's searching for him, searching for him. And then she finds somebody, a preacher at this moving, traveling, evangelical, um, church who looks exactly like Victor, but has no memory of her, doesn't even remember being Victor, but she is fully convinced is Victor. There is a mix of like the logic of like, uh, this guy like probably isn't Victor. You're just, you're losing it. You're unreliable. And so folks are somewhat gaslighting her. And then at the same time, she knows these old stories about the Rougarou, which is this like wolfy predatory figure. It's almost like fairy tale vibes I get from this, like the wolf in sheep's clothing. And it's her journey of negotiating like real and unreal, like Katniss in the Hunger Games with PETA, real or unreal. It's so good. I absolutely loved the writing. I think her writing is fantastic. I can't wait to reread this. Like you'll see a lot of these don't have notes in them because once the world fell apart with COVID, I stopped reading to analyze and just started reading to distract. And so I take notes to slow myself down and think about things. And I didn't want to do that. So like someday I would love to reread this and take notes and look at the history of the Rougarou, the storytelling aspects, because there's so much in here that I think meshes with a lot of my folklore storytelling interests. And it was just phenomenal. If you haven't read it, five out of five stars. I'm gonna change that four out of five stars to five out of five stars. This did come off my TBR. The 10th book that I read, I listened to on audio. I listened to My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa, Otessa Moshfech from Libby. Technically not on my TBR and it's not a reread. It's like, it's a, it's a new buy, but it's a library borrow. So that's a new category for me as I'm keeping track of my stats this year. And so My Year of Rest and Relaxation is about this girl who is ridiculously wealthy. She is model gorgeous, could do basically anything with her life, but has experienced a lot of trauma. Both of her parents have died. She is super isolated and her goal in life is to sleep for a year. It's about her working to achieve this goal. She finds like the shittiest therapist she can find, who she can talk into prescribing like anything. And so she's prescribed all of these sleeping pills, sleeping aids, and she's taking all of these things simultaneously and like barely eating. And I didn't even know how to rate this because it is a bizarre, I guess, approach to mental health, working through trauma. I binged the audiobook. I don't know what to do with it. And that's, that's how I'm concluding this first part of my March reading wrap up. I read my year of rest and relaxation. I don't know if I would recommend it. It's something that I would love to discuss, but it has too many content warnings for my in real life book club. Like the sidekick, the sidekick, the, the best friend of our main character is a bulimic and there's a lot of discussions of like disordered eating. Also the character, like our main character is not in a good place mentally. And like, I, like there's just too much going on for my in real life book club to be okay reading it. So if you've read it, let me know your thoughts on it. This has been an obscenely long video and now I'm gonna film about eight more books. Thank you for watching part one of my March reading wrap up. I hope you are doing well in all of this kerfluffle. I hope you're staying safe. Wash your hands, you filthy animals. Thank you to my patrons who are supporting me in this weird time. I've now been laid off because we're taking this like in two week chunks. Um, at first Indigo was saying like, oh, we'll pay you for your scheduled shifts for the first two weeks. Even though we're gonna close the retail locations, we'll, we'll pay you for those two weeks and then we'll reevaluate and go back to work, right? And then when those two weeks hit, 
they were like, yeah, actually we're laying you off for the foreseeable future. Go apply for employment insurance. If you have a dollar, you wanna tip me for the content I'm creating, the link is in the description box down below, but I also get that this is a super weird time and I'm just so thankful for the folks that I do have currently supporting the channel, so thank you. <laughs> and uh, I will see you very soon with part two of this reading wrap-up. Bye!